Zoo, zoo. He's a funny guy. Okay, what we're talking about, what are we talking extrinsic factors. We're talking about how neurons uh, develop. <clears throat> um, ex experience is an important factor in brain development. Uh, so what have all these strange things that happen to you throughout your life, uh, all of these things develop, uh, allow your brain to develop in a certain way. Uh, I have a niece. <laughs> and she had a child. So that's my, that makes her my great niece. Uh, when she, uh, she put her in front of the television to, to babysit. She was television to babysit. And she'd lay her down on a pillow. Uh, and so, and then she'd give her a bottle and whatnot, and, and so the baby's watching television. Uh, but the baby's also laying down on a pillow, so, and she always laid down on her right side. So she always had her right eye covered. And so she's watching television with her left eye and drinking out of her bottle and whatnot. And she raised her this way, so for two or three years, you know, she's doing the same thing. Uh, if she tries to lay her down on her left side, she won't lay down. She, always moves to the other end of the couch. Even when she was a tiny baby, she would lay down on her right side. <clears throat> so what happened was, this eye didn't develop, and this eye did. So she had what they call amblyopia, and we're gonna talk about amblyopia in a minute. But uh, she, it was, it was a self-induced amblyopia. Um, and so one eye, she's almost blind in her right eye, because it never developed. It was constantly being covered up. And when she lays down, she always lays down on her right side. And, she, and if she looks at anything, she looks at it, everything through her left eye. And she's blinded herself in her right eye, as weird as that is. But it was my niece's fault. Because she, that's, she was using the television to babysit the, the child. Yeah, to keep it. Right, yeah. She didn't want to pick the baby up. She pooped too much. <laughs> or she peed too much. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that weird? <laughs> she hates the smell of poop. She vomits when she smells poop. <clears throat> so she would do things like, yeah, the baby would take a dump and, uh, and uh, she'd wait until her husband came home. Man. And her really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was that stupid. That's, I've, I've seen other individuals that had the same stupidity. Uh, I, I had a, when I was in service, uh, this guy, uh, <laughs> he was from West Virginia. <laughs> His wife left him, and he, she, he left uh, him with a, with a four-month-old baby. She just ran off. Uh, and so uh, he, now all of a sudden, he's the, the sole caretaker for this baby. Well, he was okay with wet diaper, but he could not change. He vomited when he, if he got around a, a dirty diaper. Uh, the funny thing was, he worked in parasitology. He worked with sh Crap. Crap. <laughs> That's what he did. He looked for parasites in, in, uh, in feces, but he couldn't change his own baby's diaper. He would have to go next door. He, he ran next door and had the uh, lady next door change the baby's diaper if it was dirty, as weird as that seems. One time the, the baby uh, passed gas while he was changing her wet diaper, and he threw up. <clears throat> Couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle the smell, as weird as that, as that seems. Yet, he worked in parasitology, so I, I know. It was <laughs> in the world. Never made any sense to me at all. Uh, okay, so what are we doing, dealing with? The human brain is only uh, about one-fourth its adult size at birth, uh, yet it has all the neurons that it, it will ever have. Uh, so through the rest of your life, you will be... Uh, synaptogenesis will be taking place, uh, dendrite growth will be taking place, uh, myelination will be taking place, and, and that's how, where our, our intelligence comes from, is from all, that, uh, all, all of that happening. One form of extrinsic stimulation causing a problem is amblyopia. This is what amblyopia looks like. Uh, one eye is strong and the other side is weak. Uh, sometimes it has to do with genetics. Uh, my wife was, uh, had walleye when she was a child. She also has uh, astigmatism, uh, but uh, she had uh, walleye, as weird as that seems. Or so they like used to call it lazy eye. And be all, it, you said it's genetics, right? It can be genetic or it can be self-induced like with my niece, great niece. Uh, okay. So, yeah. like genetic, like 
genetic, is it like a dominant trait or is it recessive? No, it's very recessive. Thank oh, okay. God. I, I mean, otherwise, half the kids a lot in, of people would in the be... United States would have one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's fairly easy to fix. Uh, the problem is there's no balance. Uh, one eye is dominant over the other. Um, most people have a dominant, a, a dominant side, they're right-handed, they're right-footed, uh, they're right-eyed, so when you shoot a weapon, uh, you aim with the, your dominant eye. And normally your dominant eye is your right eye. That's, well, that's the way they make guns anyway. Yeah. Okay. But that doesn't always happen. Uh, even in the military, I guess they've got a new, they've got a, with the, with the old uh, M16, um, the def there was a deflection shield that shot the, uh, the spent rounds out, uh, and uh, it was it shot to the right. Yeah, it shot to the right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so if your left if your left eyed and you had to shoot the and you shot the gun on your off your left shoulder, your sh the, all these things are coming into your face, are blown into your face. But I guess they have a they have a left handed gun now. I guess that uh, ejects. Yeah. The, I see. Yeah. One, of my, one of my guys on my ranger team, uh, I was like, well, let me see that, man. He goes, he goes up southpaw, man. He was from Boston, so right. man, he, was a, he was an Irish man. Yeah. Uh, Cole Connery, he came from Irish than that. Yeah. And he, yeah, he was left. I was like, damn, that's crazy. I'm about trying to, I'm about, no, here. Yeah, yeah that, it just doesn't feel right. Um, <laughs> I had a friend who was uh, Nez Perce. Uh, I don't know if you know about the Nets purse, but they're really good shots. They're all good shots, for some unknown reason. There's the yeah, yeah. It's just something about the Nets purse. And he was cross-eyed, not cross-eyed, but he shot. He he aimed with his left eye and he shot off his right shoulder. And it shouldn't work. Yeah, it shouldn't work. It just shouldn't work. I think this guy was a he was an ace. He. Uh, was a, quite the marksman. He never missed. Wow. Uh, just an amazing shot. <clears throat> it probably has to do with being steady, I'm guessing. I don't know. But they were really good shots. Hmm. Uh, if left untreated uh, by age seven or eight, the suppressed eye will totally blind. And of course, that's not what you want. Uh, while treatment in childhood will result in perfect vision, when the problem is corrected in adulthood, the eye does not gain uh, acute vision. And of course, as you can see, it just doesn't work. And you, you, it, I don't know if you've ever run into one of these individuals, their eye is always looking in the wrong direction. So what they have done, what they do is they do surgery and they'll open the pupil up. So even though the eye looks, it looks like it's, it's, it's looking at, your, at, its, at this person's nose, they're actually looking straight out. But it drives you crazy because we are, well, we look at people's eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you had one eye that's going in the wrong direction, it would just give me the whim whams. It, you know, it, it just does. <clears throat> as weird as that is. Uh, this is because uh, when the problem is allowed to remain the same over time, the neural connections in the, in the brain from uh, the weak eye are not as intricate, and of course they don't see nearly as well. And they don't actually have bi binocular vision. So potentially these individuals couldn't drive. Because their their depth perception isn't very good, uh, and that's how you fix it. <clears throat> you force them to use the uh, the weak eye, uh, and you do this by covering up the, the strong eye. Uh, you know you can't go. Well, I, I you know I need to exercise my weak eye. It doesn't work because your your dominant eye will always be dominant. So what you have to do is you have to cover up the dominant eye. Uh, understanding of amblyopia and other asymmetrical, as, asymmetrically balanced neural connections has been studied by performing binocular deprivation research on laboratory animals. Uh, the first time they did this was with cats. Uh, so they created a cat with amblyopia. And then they tried to fix it, fix it and they were able to fix it. Of course, uh, a cat, uh, cats are a little bit different than humans. They're more, a little bit more intense physically intense, uh, so they were able to, to fix the cat's eye fairly readily. Now, interestingly, uh, if it's a dog's eye, it doesn't, it doesn't heal as, as readily as a cat's eye does, because cats are a little bit more intense. 
<laughs> and this can happen in like animals as well? Yeah, I had a cat that had a, a milky eye. <clears throat> oh, okay. And he... Uh, because, well, well, not, not any, just my nieces, they have cats. So their cats all have six toes. Oh, okay. So that's, like, is that... That's a mutation. Okay, yeah. Uh, 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 what? They have six toes on all of its paws. <laughs> so you can see the six ones sticking out this way. Yeah. yeah. That's weird, isn't it? And their ears are really pointy. Okay. Like, really, really pointy. Like, huh. like, like a triangular pointy. It's oh, like, wow. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of exciting. It's different. I've had six toed cats before. Um, and they were all calicos. Uh, what else? What else was weird about those cats? Uh, they and they didn't reproduce very well, but I don't know. Because like the mom is a six, six, six to to cat, cat, but not the dad. But um, when they came out, there was five of them, and four of them had six toes, and one of them didn't. Oh, was that right? And the four that had six toes were all like uh, brown colored. Uh, they were like dark brown, like a mocha kind of uh -huh. color. And this one's the only one that was yellow. <laughs> it was, I thought it was interesting. It's connected. I, all that stuff is connected. I'm, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure why. Uh, all calico cats are female. All, uh, uh, all tortoise shell cats are, are, are uh, a female. Okay. For some reason. So you never find a calico male. You never find a tortoise shell male. They're always female. Mm, okay. I know. <laughs> Researchers have discovered that sensory organs have a sensitive period uh, when the neural development is crucial for stimulation to induce proper dendritic uh, connections. If stimulation uh, does not occur by this time, recovery to a normal state is impossible. Uh, so you have to, uh, uh, you, they have to get the stimulation at the right time. You have to correct it at the right time. Uh, to understand why people tend to have dominant eyes, it must be remembered that each eye represents millions of receptors vying for attention in the brain. Uh, when one eye receives more stimulation, those guys are knocked on the, on the women's restroom door. Andrea's going to take care of it. He ain't doing nothing to me. She's going to tuck her ear off and leave. Yeah, but she, yeah, she'll take care of it. There was somebody in there. I don't know. Uh-oh. I don't know. She'll figure it out. Uh, when one eye receives more stimulation than the other, some of the synapses in the brain connected to the unstimulated eye become weaker, and this is the problem. This is why one eye is stronger than the other. Uh, this is why you, you shoot with one eye or you, you aim with one eye. Uh, you're, uh, if you were looking at something, then you would try to look at it with your strong eye, which is probably your right eye, since most people are right-eyed. While most synapses do not fluctuate in their strength with stimulation, some do. These synapses are, uh, are known as Hebbian synapses. Uh, those are the ones that fluctuate as to strength and weakness. The weak, weaker ones are heavy in synapses. 75 years ago, the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States was uh, fetal ketonuria, PKU. 2% of the population carries the recessive gene. Most of these people are white. <clears throat> the gene controls the enzyme that breaks down fetal alanine and amino acid and protein. Because the enzyme does not break down the phenylalanine, a toxic level collects in the brain and destroys brain cells. And this is the reason why we draw babies' blood right after they're born. We need to check their PKU. We also need to check their thyroid function to make sure that they're, that they're not cre cretins, that they don't have uh, a, uh, they're not hypothyroid. If they're hypothyroid, their brains can't develop. So when they do the little thing on their foot? Yeah. I was wondering what they did. And they do that, have to do that within 24 hours. Uh, well, they have to do that right after they, uh, right after they drink milk, after they take in protein. 
Once they take in protein, they need to, to check their, uh, their PKU level to make sure that they don't have a toxic level of, of this phenyl ketone urea. Anything that's urea is a waste product, yeah, phenyl ketone urea. Uh, it's a waste product, and it, as a waste product, it collects in the brain and destroys brain cells. So they need to find out as soon as possible. Uh, if somebody is, is uh, phenyl ketone uric, uh, then uh, they need to, and it probably says on, on your, on your uh, pop that, that, that uh, it has phenylalanine in it. See, if you, were, if you were one of these individuals, you couldn't drink that because it has phenylalanine in it. And of course, you'd have to try to break that down. So they just put them on a special diet where they don't take in regular protein. Oh, yeah, it does. Then uh, whatever tonric contains, uh, yeah, that was yeah, yeah. Phenyl ketone urics, it, it contains phenylalanine, that's what it says. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's for the people that are PKU, or have PKU, or collect PKU. So they have to put them on a special diet. Where and they that affects the, the brain cells, you said? Right, it accumulates in the brain this phenyl ketone urea and, and it's a tox it's a toxin it's a it's a waste product mm -hmm. and they don't they can't break it down you know everybody in this the, of the three of us in this room we're able to break it down so we can eat anything we want we can take in all the phenylalanine we want obviously scott's over there swilling his diet coke with phenylalanine in it and, yeah. he, and you're all right <laughs> okay no <laughs> exactly <laughs> But they can't. They can't. They have to eat special foods and whatnot. Uh, but 75 years ago, uh, you know, almost all the people that had uh, any kind of uh, uh, intellectual deficit, uh, this was this this was the cause. And most of them were white people because that's it's a a, a trait. It's a recessive gene that uh, uh, can repeat itself, and so you have to be very careful. Uh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> Phenyl ketone urea. <laughs> Williams syndrome is, a, syndrome is a relatively rare genetic abnormality that causes neural and facial abnormalities as well as mild intellectual disability. These guys are really kind of interesting. People with Williams syndrome are the happiest people in the world. But their problem is they don't remember things. But they're happy. They're just so happy. They're the most pleasant people you can possibly imagine. So it's kind of like finding Dory. Finding Nemo, that fish. I. Oh, the cartoon. Oh, I. Oh. See, I miss all the good stuff. Oh, uh, that fish Dory. She oh, has Dory, the, the the fish. The one with short term memory yeah. loss. I don't know if I don't know if she has Williams syndrome. Oh well, she's the happiest. <laughs> she's the happiest fish in the world. <laughs> Research indicates that Williams syndrome is caused by an incomplete chromosomal structure of the seventh chromosome. Uh, these individuals have normal linguistic ability. And that's the weird part. They, they can talk your ear off. I mean, they're really, really, and they're so pleasant. They're just, and you can, uh, you can insult them, you can be mean to them. They don't recognize it. So you can do anything that you want, and they, they've got a smile on their face. It's yeah. just the weirdest thing in the world. Um, they can't learn by, by watching, uh, but they can read, and they can learn by reading. Uh, they tend to be really good musicians, as weird as that sounds. Uh, so they, they have the ability to speak, and they speak very, very well. And they, they'll talk, your, like I said, they'll talk your ear off. And they have the ability to learn music for some reason. It's just the weirdest thing. Uh, individuals with Williams syndrome have very characteristic facial features. They have broad, they look alike. They all look alike. They have broad foreheads. They have small eye openings. They have low nasal bridges. Uh, the nostrils uh, point forward, so they have pug noses. Uh, they have long areas between the nose and the upper lip. Uh, their cheeks are full or, and high. Uh, they have large, downturned mouths. Uh, so if he wasn't smiling, which he does all the time anyway, if he wasn't smiling, uh, his mouth would be turned down, but they're big. They're, they, go, they look like a Julia Roberts' mouth, you know. They're just mm. really wide mouths. They all look alike, as weird as that seems. It's like they're all identical twins or something. Uh, but as you can see, 
you know, none of these people are related. We saw the little boy before. He kind of looks, he could be, he could be everybody's brother here, but he's not, of course. She doesn't really have green hair. It's the picture that has been, has turned green over time. But as you can <laughs> see, they all, they all look alike. They have pointed, pointed chins. Yeah. Williams Syndrome. <clears throat> I thought my grandson had Williams Syndrome when he was born. Happiest baby in the world. I'd never seen a, happy, a baby that happy. And I worked in nurseries, you know, for 30 years. Uh, and I'd never seen a baby that happy. But it was just that he, everything was being taken care of. He's not happy now. <laughs> he's getting older, he's getting grouchier. <laughs> uh, Down syndrome is a condition caused by the addition of an extra chromosome among the 21st pair uh, of chromosomes. So they have three chromosomes instead of two. Uh, this abnormality can cause mild to severe intellectual disability and various uh, physical uh, anomalies such as uh, heart uh, uh, malformations and brittle arteries. So these individuals don't usually live very long. They don't usually live uh, to old age, I, I can say that. However, there's an individual on uh, the Fort Belknap Reservation, they call him the mayor. He's in his 50s. And he has Down syndrome, sweetest guy in the whole wide world. One time, uh, I went to their uh, uh, went, I went to their powwow, and uh, he and I know each other, of course. <laughs> I don't know how he remembers me, uh, but he saw me across the powwow, <laughs> the powwow ground, and he just he crossed right. <laughs> they were dancing, and he just runs runs across and, and gives me a big hug. It was really 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 sweet. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, he has Down syndrome. He's the nicest guy in the world, just the nicest guy. Everybody loves him. Uh, he can go any place on the reservation. And people feed him, they take care of him. If he's in the wrong place at night, they'll, they'll uh, uh, let him sleep in, you know, they'll let him sleep in their house and that kind of stuff. He usually, he's, he, he has some people that, are, that take care of him. But uh, yeah, I, I wonder what's going to happen to him when his mother dies. But he's in his 50s, which is amazing. These guys usually don't live that long, but he's doing pretty good. And usually they don't live that long because of the heart malformations and the brittle arteries. It's kind of like having diabetes. Uh, they tend to have um, uh, intestinal problems as well. Mm -hmm. um, they get um, uh, blockages in their intestines. How about the brittle arteries? Like, is it? Are they, are they like really like the diet is completely different as well? Do you mean if we put? I'm sorry. Like their 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 diet, like what they eat. Yeah, no, it doesn't have anything to do with their diet. It has it's it has to do with uh, just like uh, individuals that have diabetes have brittle arteries. Okay. Okay. They're they go blind. Um, when they first invented uh, birth control pills, they were, they were high doses of, of estrogen that kept the woman from getting pregnant. Uh, but estrogen tends to make the, the uh, uh, arteries brittle. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, the first arteries that became brittle were the ones in the eyes, uh, in the optic nerve. So what happened was that women who were taking birth control pills, sometimes they went blind. Mm -hmm. as, sad as it is. Eventually they figured it out. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of the same way. It doesn't have anything to do with, with their diet. It has to do with their arteries. Their arteries are just brittle. Mm -hmm. As sad as that is. And there you can see, here's an individual with trisomy 21. That means they have three chromosomes. And this individual, of course, uh, is a female. We can see that uh, the uh, sex gene is uh, the same. They, are, they have two uh, X chromosomes. Uh, trisomy 21 is more prevalent in older women, probably because of the age of the ova. So in the, if, if somebody gets pregnant uh, in their late 30s, early 40s, the probability of having uh, Down syndrome baby is very high. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter teaches biology, and she got pregnant at 42. Um, and of course, I teach this stuff all the time. Uh, so both of us were monitoring what was going on with her pregnancy. You know, every time she went in, she'd have her blood drawn, and, and they'd check all this stuff out. Uh, so we were both, and we both knew 
exactly when uh, the baby became viable at, at about 22 weeks. Uh, so we were we were both on pins and needles watching this baby develop, <clears throat> and we unfortunately we had both of us had ex extensive knowledge in this area, so you know it was probably a little bit more uh, anxiety producing for us than it w would have been for for anybody else. <laughs> But he, she made it, and the, like I said, the baby's the happiest baby I've ever seen. But I thought he had Williams syndrome. I really did. Not that his face was weird, but uh, I don't like people with William, Williams syndrome. But he was just so happy. He never cried. The only time he cried was if he woke up uh, from a bad dream. And he, he seemed to have bad dreams uh, from birth. As weird as that is. He also hiccuped while he was in the womb. And now he hiccups all the time, which is a little weird. <laughs> Research shows that individuals with trisomy 21 have abnormal formations of their dendritic spines, making it more difficult to learn. Wait a minute. I can show you a picture of a little monkey. <clears throat> I just got one yesterday. For some reason, every time he flies, the, the pilots and the stewardesses just go crazy over the kid. I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. Come on, open up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yesterday, they sent me a picture of him in somewhere, if he's in here. That's him. That's him. The first day of school. He's a pretty happy fella. He's also real. Uh, uh, he's a, he's very huggy. He likes to hug people. So he he touches people a lot. Puts his arm around people. Gets in trouble all the time. Yeah, there he is. That's it. He just flew back from from Florida. His dad lives in Florida, and there he is in the pilot seat. I know which side, which side you fly the plane from. You fly the plane from the left side, okay? So that's the co-pilot checking everything out. Here's my, here's my grandson in the, in the pilot seat. <laughs> and that was from, you said from Florida? From Florida, yeah. Oh, okay. And that happened yesterday. So, uh, or, or uh, Monday, flew, flew back on Monday. So <laughs> monkey. Anyway, Mr. Happy Boy. There he is showing off his missing tooth. <laughs> ah, what a kid. I'll stop bragging about my grandson. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe he does have down Williamson. Um, the most frequent form of inherited intellectual uh, disability uh, today is Fragile X Syndrome. used to be PKU, now it's Fragile X. And as you can see, uh, the, one of the X chromosomes has extra uh, genetic material at the bottom. Well, that, if that genetic material breaks off, then this child has, a, has, has some missing uh, uh, genes, obviously, and uh, they will not develop normally. They will have an intellectual deficit. The DNA of these select chromosomes seems more pinched and fragile, uh, more likely to, to break off. And of course, if it does break off, we got a problem. Uh, the real problem seems to be an excessively repeated trinucleotide uh, that is in, in an abundance four times that of, norm, that of normal times normal, thus causing the extended appearance of the chromosome. Uh, so it has uh, this nucleotide keeps, uh, this trinucleotide keeps repeating itself. And for that reason, it looks like there's extra material. Uh, as you can see, this is a, uh, a girl because there's two X chromosomes. This is a boy, of course. Uh, males tend to be worse off than females. Why? Because the females have uh, two X chromosomes, and, and the good X chromosome will cancel out the bad X chromosome. So it's not nearly as severe in females as it is in males. Males, of course, the Y chromosome is, is, uh, looks like an incomplete chromosome, actually, is what it looks like. Uh, so it can't cancel things out. So, so bad things happen to males a lot more frequently than it happens to females. 
because females get Marius. Hello? Yeah. No, I'm in class. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay, don't worry about it. Sure. Yeah. That's all right. I can't get into your office unless you give me your... Don't text it. Email it to me. Because I, I don't get text message. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Marcus. See, I'm telling you. The guy's goofy. It's this baby. How far she go? Uh, let's see. She's, she hasn't made 22 weeks yet. I think she's 16, 18 weeks, something like that. That's like what, four months? Yeah. Yeah. She's starting to show. And he's getting, he's getting worse. He's getting nice, you know? <clears throat> He's just goofy. He forgets well, he's, things. He's, he's, he's kind strong anyway. Right? Yeah, kind of. I, he, he forgot his keys the other day, and I had to lend him my keys. Uh, what a goofball. Oh, it's on tape, isn't it? <laughs> the whole conversation. No, he's, he's a good guy. He's a lot of fun. Anyway, okay, so you can see they look alike, too. These are individuals uh, with, with fragile X. Uh, the individual has uh, a broad forehead. Uh, their faces are elongated. Uh, they, they tend to be cross-eyed. Uh, they have a hard, highly arched palate, which, which means it's difficult for them to learn to talk because they can't, uh, their tongue goes too far up in their mouths. So it's, oh, okay. it, it, uh, they, they, th they have a speech impediment of sorts. Uh, they're, they have hyper-extensible uh, joints, so they, they're, it's like every joint is double-jointed, but that's a good thing and it's a bad thing because they, uh, they can pop out. The joints will pop out of a socket uh, fairly easily. Uh, they tend to rub their hands a lot, so their, their hands tend to be uh, highly callous, um, they're, if you look at their chests, uh, their chest, instead of being flat or, or, or punching out a little bit, it, it goes in, as weird as that is. So it looks like they have a heart condition. If somebody has a heart condition, they have to breathe really hard, it'll suck the sternum in, yeah, and then they'll have a concave chest. And these guys have a concave chest. Uh, mitral valve prolapse, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a heart condition. Uh, if it's a male, they have enlarged testicles for no reason whatsoever. Um, they have really poor muscle tone, so they, it's not like they can work out and, and get all buff. Uh, they're, because of their, their muscle tone is hard, non-existent, uh, their skin is, is fleshy and soft. Uh, they tend to have all kinds of interesting problems, like, well, they have joint problems, so their feet are flat. And, of course, flat feet, that is a joint problem. Uh, and they tend to have seizures. Uh, about 10% of them have seizures. And, of course, they have an intellectual deficit as well. About 40% of children born to alcoholic mothers show a distinctive profile of anatomical, physiological, and behavioral impairments known as fetal alcohol syndrome. This is a normal baby. As you can see, you can see all the convolutions. You can see the brain mass. It's, it's relatively extensive. This is a baby born with FAS. And as you can see, there are much fewer uh, convolutions. It's a much smaller brain. Um, the, so the brain mass is much smaller. <clears throat> uh, children uh, suffering from FAS show stunted growth in select facial lab, uh, anomalies. Their brains are small, as we saw before from, oops, I'm sorry. Their brains are tiny, as you can see. Um, small eye sockets, flat mid-face, uh, indistinct philtrum, 
Uh, in other words, uh, this, this crease you have in, uh, right under your nose doesn't exist for these individuals. It's, they have a flat lip. Uh, they have uh, a thin upper lip, uh, small chins, short nose, lower ears, uh, the, a low nasal bridge right here, uh, epicanthic folds in their eyelids, so they look uh, uh, Asian. They, they have epicanthic folds. Epicanthic folds are a fat layer underneath in your eyelid, as weird as that is. Uh, you don't have to be Asian, of course, to have epicanthic folds. Um, my sisters have epicanthic folds for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why. We don't have, we're, we're, we're white, I mean, we're just really white. Uh, <laughs> we don't have any, anything exotic in our, in our ancestry, which is kind of tragic. It's like we all married our next door neighbors or something. I mean, we've, it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, as tragic as that is. This is what a normal brain looks like. As you can see, the corpus callosum is fairly extensive on the normal brain. It's almost non-existent in the, uh, in the child with FAS. Now, what does that do? Well, if your brain can't, if uh, le the left hemisphere of your brain can't, can't communicate with the right hemisphere of your brain, now we got a really serious problem. Uh, talk about being hardwired. Uh, females, of course, I talked about this before, uh, females recover from a stroke far more readily than a male does. Uh, far, well, it's they, more readily than a male does. But, and it's because their corpus callosum is larger. So there's more communication taking place between the, the two hemispheres of the brain. But with this child, it's almost like they're hardwired. They can only think of one thing at a time and things like that. Uh, so it's a really serious problem. Uh, with my 240 class, uh, I asked them uh, what should happen with a mother that, that uh, drinks, with a mother that takes drugs, and potentially affects their, their child. I said some states are starting to arrest these individuals and, and uh, charge them with child endangerment. Uh, they, and I asked them if they thought that was a good idea. And almost to an individual, they said yes. If the mother, if the mother damages the, the baby, then the mother should be punished for it. I'm not sure what good that's going to do. But uh, anyway, it was a question. Brain impairment is due to their small brain and brain structure problems uh, like the almost absent corpus callosum, uh, the reduction of cerebral cortical gy gyri, uh, the, the folds in your brain. Uh, intellectual disability can be mild to severe, possibly depending on the time during pregnancy and the level of consumption. Uh, you can drink during pregnancy and have no problems with your baby. Your baby won't have uh, FAS. Uh, but if you drink at the wrong time and you drink in the, in the wrong way, then uh, your baby will have all kinds of interesting problems. Uh, you don't have to consume a lot of alcohol and really affect your baby drastically. It all depends on when you drink and uh, how much you drink when you drink. Uh, binge drinking tends to be the worst because if you are a binge drinker uh, and you only drink on the weekends, but you drink large amounts of alcohol, for the, that whole weekend, the, the baby's brain is, uh, 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 is drowning in alcohol. So for those two or three days, the, the baby's brain's not going to develop at all. Now, oddly enough, alcohol has an affinity for brain tissue. We used to think it had an affinity for baby's brain tissue, but it just has an affinity for brain tissue. So it does the same thing when you drink. Uh, the, you drink and, and it goes right to your head. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, you, sometimes you can tolerate it to some extent, depending on how much you're drinking, uh, but it goes right to your brain, has, has an affinity for brain tissue, as weird as that is. And what will happen if you consume a lot of alcohol, it starts in, your, in the front of your brain, in the, in the reasoning portion of your brain, and it kind of anesthetizes its way back to your uh, cerebellum. Yeah. And once it gets to your cerebellum, of course, now all of a sudden you can't, you can't walk very well because that's the part that, that is a part of your brain that controls your, your movement. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning, if you, you know, with your first couple beers, you get stupid, but at least you can walk with, without too much trouble. But after, you know, after that, uh, you finish that second six six pack. Now you got a problem. 
now now you're walking funny, and you your your keys you can, can't get your keys in the in your mission or any or your or yeah, or your, yeah, I, and so you're for an hour and a half you're trying to get your key in your door lock and you can't get it unlocked, which is a good thing if it's your car, but if it's your house, you probably fall asleep on your stoop or something, whatever. Anyway. I'm making light of this, and this is really serious stuff. Uh, if she's pregnant, she probably doesn't need to, to consume alcohol. Otherwise, she's going to produce a baby that looks like that. Um, as I said, my daughter's a uh, biology teacher, so she knew all this stuff. Uh, so during her pregnancy, she took uh, special uh, vitamins uh, to develop the baby's brain. She didn't drink caffeine. Um, of course, she didn't drink uh, alcohol, certainly didn't drink alcohol. But she stayed away from caffeine. She stayed away from, from pineapple or something. Or was it, was it uh, there's a juice that if you drink it, it mixes with vitamins and it causes a, a toxic level of something. It's grapefruit? It's grapefruit juice, yeah, it's grapefruit juice. And I don't have any idea why grapefruit juice is, is bad, but other, other juices, other citrus juices are good. I don't know. Besides intellectual disability, uh, children with FAS also show signs, uh, such neurological abnormalities as hyperactivity, irritability, and tremulousness. Uh, studies also seem to indicate that marijuana may have the same effects as alcohol. Uh, so this is something that we have to stay away from. This is kind of an interesting picture. Uh, this is a group of uh, Germans with FAS. Germans drink a lot of alcohol. Now, the, the, one, the German women don't drink as much as the men do, of course. Almost all the men drink a lot of, a lot of alcohol um, in Germany. Anyway, as you can see, uh, these are German children with FAS, and they have classic uh, facial features uh, that show that they, they are FAS. Now, the interesting thing about this picture um, is that uh, six of these individuals have, have black hair and only two of these individuals have blonde hair. A lot of blonde Germans. <clears throat> Not that many dark-headed Germans. Hitler was, had black hair. Uh, but, uh, so who has dark hair in Germany? Do you guys know anything about Germany? Have you ever been stationed in Germany? I just went to law school. Yeah, yeah oh, that's right, you were, you were law school. Uh, well, on the, I, I lived there for three for three years. Um, Dark-haired people are, are Catholics, for one thing. Uh, well, Blonde-headed people are, are Lutherans, and they live up north. They're Vikings, they live up north. So the people that live around München, Mün, uh, uh, Munich, uh, they are uh, they're Catholic. And they tend to have dark hair, they don't always have dark hair. But there are, there are two groups in, in Germany that always have black hair. The Turks, ah, okay. uh, who aren't supposed to drink alcohol because they're Muslim. Uh, and the other group are the Gypsies. And uh, the uh, Germans hate the Gypsies. I, they've been hating Gypsies for centuries. I was surprised they didn't kill them all off when they killed off. Who's that? The That's guy. what we mean. Trim Tremulous? Trim yeah. Was it, wasn't Hitler Austrian? I'm sorry? Hitler was Austrian. Hitler was Austrian, yeah, but he was born, uh, he was, uh... His, wasn't his, his mother was German or something, wasn't it? Uh, he, he was born on, at, in a little town on the Austrian-German border. Oh, so you claim either? Yeah. And, and um, one, the rumor was that his grandfather was Jewish. We should see, it, it, uh, it follows the male line. So yeah. in order for somebody to be Jewish, they, their father has to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. okay. Their mother doesn't have to be Jewish. It doesn't really matter what their mother is. So at the beginning, when they started uh, arresting all the Jews in Germany, uh, if your father was Jewish, then they arrested you. Eventually, of course, after they killed off all the, the people that had uh, uh, a male ancestor that was, that was Jewish, they started killing off the ones that had female ancestors. Wasn't well, his, his, his mom? Jewish? No, it was his grandfather. His grandfather on his mother's side. So, 
Yeah. Well, oh, or this. Well, I, I, it, it may be propaganda. You know, they call him Schickle Gruber. You know, that was uh, a lot of propaganda going on. Yeah. yeah. The one of the other thing was uh, that he had only one testicle, and uh, he had a fetish for women defecating on his head. This sounds like pure fantasy to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, he did take a lot of um, amphetamines. Uh, yeah. Uh, autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong developmental disorder that is characterized by slight to severe social impairment and language. 70% uh, of uh, children with ASD develop poor language skills, rarely getting beyond monosyllabic responses and echolalia. This is not especially true anymore. Uh, we have a, an, an intense program uh, where we train these individuals to interact. Uh, the problem is that they don't, uh, they won't look people in the eye. They don't look at people. They don't look at people's faces. And that's one of the reasons why they're suffering uh, so drastically. We are, as humans, we are mimics. We mimic each other. Uh, so uh, both of you had your hands up uh, in your face. Uh, potentially, I would do the same thing because, you know, I'm human, so I, I try to mimic your behavior. When you go someplace where you're not like the other, like other individuals, uh, you start watching people very, very closely, and you start mimicking their behavior. You may even mimic their speech pattern. Uh, the first time I went up north to uh, to Montana, uh, people in Montana have a Canadian accent. They overpronounce their O's. So all of a sudden, I sounded like somebody from uh, uh, what is that movie, Fargo. <laughs> Fargo, you know. So I started over pronouncing my O's, and they didn't even notice. You know, here yeah. I'm, I'm this guy that's living in, in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, and all of a sudden I just start talking like they are, you know, like over pronouncing your O's, eh? And, you know, putting the A at the end of your sentences from time to time. Uh, anyway, so that's the way people, that's the way most humans are. We are mimics. Uh, but these individuals can't mimic because they don't look at people. Uh, they try to filter people out. They try to filter in, uh, human interaction out. Uh, autism spectrum disorder doesn't have to correspond with any mental deficiency, but the lack of social interaction may impair the diagnosis, and this is the biggest problem that we have. Uh, people with autism spectrum disorder can be totally functional uh, to not non-functional whatsoever. So these individuals do tend to learn, learn to, to speak later. Even people with Asperger's syndrome, uh, they, they tend to have a difficult time uh, interacting with, uh, with people in their environment. Now one of the weird things uh, about Asperger's syndrome, I, I have uh, worked with a lot of individuals, uh, other college professors, and I would swear they had Asperger's syndrome. They had the ability, they only thought of one thing at a time, just drove you, drives you crazy because they have, and they have no uh, interpersonal skills. I had a friend in college, uh, and I swear he had Asperger's syndrome. Became a college professor, teaches uh, English literature, mm -hmm. most boring subject you can possibly imagine. He's a very attractive man, and because he's very attractive, he's very successful because attractive people tend to be successful. So despite the fact that he speaks in a monosyllable and he's, there's no dy dynamism to him whatsoever, he's such a pretty guy that people want him to succeed. So he was a track star. He had all these positive things. And he also had sex with my first wife. I know. Yeah. He's a friend of mine. But I don't really blame him. Uh, for one thing, she probably seduced him. But the other thing is that, uh, that he probably didn't even realize what was going on anyway. I, he was kind of oblivious to what was happening around him. Kind of a weird guy. <clears throat> anyway, kind of a strange fellow. But I've seen a lot of college professors who uh, were so focused on what they were doing, it's almost like they were autistic. And, and that's the way autistic people are. Autistic people, in order uh, for them to uh, be able to function, uh, they will focus on one thing. Everything else disturbs them. So what they will do is they will focus on one thing. 
And as long as they can focus on one thing, they can function. As long as they're doing that one thing. If you've ever seen Rain Man, of course, Rain Man, um, yeah. uh, Dustin Hoffman uh, is playing uh, an individual with, with autism. And he has the ability to, to do things. But he has to do every, everything has to be the same. Everything is, is uh, it, you know, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he has to watch this television show, uh, those kinds of things. It's, and and he's, he can't get used to uh, new people around him. Uh, all the people have to be exactly the same. Uh, so that's somebody with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, normally when an individual meets a stranger, they scan their faces for recognition and potentially put the, this information in their long-term memory. Uh, one of the first things that we do is we, uh, if it's somebody that, that we're not, if it's somebody like us, then we try to memorize their face. If it's somebody that's not like us, we try to identify who they are. Are, are they are they African? Are, do they have African ancestry? Uh, are they Hispanic? Are they uh, native? Are they white? We try to identify them by by ethnicity, as, and that's not odd. I mean, that's that's logical. We're we're trying to to identify friends and enemies. Uh, as humans, of course, especially <clears throat> modern man, uh, uh, we need to recognize our enemies because our enemies can kill us. We need to recognize whether that person is potentially going to attack us or not. This has been going on for you know tens of thousands of years. <clears throat> sometimes we they're good people and sometimes they're bad people. We don't just assume that everybody's good. We need to identify if we see somebody, just like I saw those two guys out there, I needed to determine if they were good guys or bad guys. Because they were doing something weird. They were doing something odd. Now, if they had just been walking up and down, there's, there's, there's no problem with that. But they were looking for somebody in the bathroom, the women's bathroom. And that's not right. That's, that's something odd. So potentially there was something going on. And I'm sure Andrea, as I said before, I'm sure she took care of it because they went away with her. So she's, and somebody came out of the bathroom after they left. So it may, be, it may have been that they were looking for someone. <clears throat> is that okay? Can anybody go into the women's restroom, any male go into the women's restroom looking for somebody? Is that all right? No, that's a problem. Potentially that's something uh, that shouldn't be happening. Anyway, so we, we're, we're looking for danger on a continual basis, despite the fact that what kind of danger is around here? Are they going to steal your car? Are they going to shoot you? No problem. Not. That's not probably not going to happen, but there's always a possibility that somebody wants to do somebody harm. So should I just should I have assumed that uh, there was nothing wrong with those two guys? Is that what you would have done if you saw these guys knocking on the women's bathroom door? Uh, I would have given. See, we're trained. We're trained to to, uh, to be da to, to to notice danger, right? The military trains you to recognize danger. So I, it, it just triggered something when I saw those guys knocking on the door. I see women going into the bathroom all the time. I don't see guys knocking on the door looking for somebody. <clears throat> Uh, individuals with autism show brain scans where they seek uh, no recognition and therefore have, no dif have, have a difficult time making new acquaintances. Uh, they don't look at people's faces. They don't recognize them the next time they see them. There has to be something specific that's going on. So the young lady just went into the restroom just a second ago. I'm the bathroom monitor. That's my job. That's your job. No. <laughs> uh, how would we block that door? I guess we, we could put stuff in front of it. We could stack up the, the tables so that, that so nobody could open the door. We're thinking about, I'm thinking about an active shooter. The door opens in. So if we stacked, I don't know these have wheels though. Maybe we could take the wheels off. No, you should do the glass. Well, I know. But, well, I, that, the other, that, that, this is a really dangerous room. But I guess if you press yourself up against here so that they couldn't really see us very well. 
Well, that's just dead, but this is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He's got a saw rifle real yeah, yeah, anyway. Oh, he can just shoot right through. Yeah. But the problem is, there's no place to hide it. No. I don't know. We get close enough. Well, but we could block the door so he couldn't get in. I think we can block the door so he couldn't get in. Or she, whichever the case may be. Yeah. But the two guys that I saw looking for that, that young lady. The guys, okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a dangerous room. There's yeah, no, we're pretty much good. Yeah, there's no way to there's no way to hide in here. I guess maybe we could put uh, they could still see. Well, the best thing would be go against this wall. Yeah. Because how it is. Right. And then Yeah, they can't shoot down. through this wall. Unless they shoot at a freaking angle. Well mm -hmm. they could shoot through the windows and just put their arms. Yeah. Shoot through the windows and shoot through the bottom that that uh, wall, but not not this wall. I guess we could all hide behind the podium. Well, I mean, what we could do, we could stack thing, we could stack these things up, uh, and, and uh, put everybody back here. That's what we could do. Don't worry, we got everything taken care of. Oh, I got close to them. This is a dangerous room. I, there's just no way to, uh, except uh, unless we put up a barrier right over here. But we could block that door, I think. Yeah, we could stack the, the, the desks up so that he could he couldn't push the door open. Yeah, that's the best we can do. And then put a, a barricade right here. There's really not much you can do in this room. Yeah, there's not much you can do. I mean, it's not going to... That's the best thing to go in that corner right there because you have to shoot at an angle. Yeah. But, I mean, we're sitting right here. Our legs are going to be out and our chest. Yeah, well, if we're behind... The, if that's bulletproof glass, I, it's not bulletproof. It's deep. From five, five, six, go right through there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, don't worry. Scott and I will take care of everything. I get close enough. I can take him out with the pen. Yeah, well, yeah, but we have to get close enough to him. <clears throat> now, if he just had a knife, we'd be okay. <laughs> but if he's got an a AR-15 with a 100-round magazine, he'd just blow us up pieces. Yeah, that's okay. We'll figure it out. Uh, autism spectrum disorder seems to have something to do with brain organization. Particularly, all information is organized differently from a normal uh, control. Uh, autism spectrum disorder seems to affect from one to two children per thousand. Uh, it is far more common among male children than female children. And it seems to run in families. So we, we see these, uh, the, these genetic aspects. We see ADHD, of course. Uh, we see bipolar disorder, we see depression, we see uh, schizophrenia, uh, and we see autism spectrum disorder, all in the same family. And as I said before, it may just manifest itself in different ways, depending. So if you have, uh, if you have ADHD in your family, potentially uh, you'll see somebody with schizophrenia in your family. Various areas of the brain show abnormalities among uh, autism spectrum disorder children, including the corpus callosum. Uh, autism spectrum disorder, formerly called Asperger syndrome, seems to be a less severe uh, form of uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, where the individual does not suffer from language deficits, but has problems with social interactions. And of course, that's my friend. Are all these syndromes and stuff named after the people who found them? Yeah. Who figured it out? Send after the doctor. Yeah. Or yeah. Whatever. Asperger. Yeah. Asperger was the doctor. Not autism, of course. Autism means they they have no interaction, no interaction. So what is was it uh, a ASO? Then Lou Gehrig, because he was a Lou Gehrig's disease. That's uh, uh, ASO or A. What is the A? Athero. Is it athero? Lateral sclerosis? Yeah, I think that's it. Athero. So he was like the first person that actually showed signs of it? Well, it's the first, it, the first famous person we ever saw with, uh, with this. We just called it the wasting disease before. But then Lou Gehrig got it, and everybody was all upset because Lou Gehrig died. And he died really quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but then, yeah, that, that's why we call it the Lou Gehrig's disease. 
As people age, they, uh, there seems to be a steady decline in brain size uh, that begins as early as the 30s and begins to accelerate after age 40. Uh, so you look at my head, it's, it's really small, uh, but uh, the brain inside is probably like a pea bouncing around. Well, I'm 70 years old, so <laughs> my brain is probably pretty small. However, the degree of decline seems to vary from individual to individual. Uh, from barely evident to, to exaggerated. Yet brain expansion seems to continue to occur as is evidenced by the presence of growth cones in the frontal lobe even in the oldest individual. And as I told you before, my mother used to do crossword puzzles every day. Uh, she did this until she was in her, uh, until she was about 97 years old. Uh, she could answer any question you had about uh, uh, about, uh, and, and as I told you before, there were certain things that she didn't want to learn about. Didn't want to learn about the Lord of the Rings. She didn't want to learn about uh, Harry Potter. Uh, that, that kind of stuff really irritated her. Now these are the two guys. One of them's got gloves on. It's kind of interesting. Now, Maybe they, they were work. clean. They must work here. Yeah. They must work here. They had the hats, the night college hats on. Okay. So we're okay. Maybe. Um, what else did I want to tell you? Something about being old. Brain expansion seems to continue to occur, as is evidenced by the presence of growth cones. Okay. I can't think of what I was going to tell so you. So actually, like doing stuff that stimulate your yeah. The, 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 the more you stimulate your brain, the more you keep it active, and you're okay. Yeah. I, I try to do like. Uh, Work searches or something sure. like that. Yeah, there you go. Anything, anything that stimulates your brain. I do those Sudoku things. Those you know, the nines. Yeah. Off, man. I can't even do it. <laughs> There's a trick to it. I know the trick. <laughs> I figured out the trick. It's taken me like five years to figure this out, but now I can do just about any of them. As an individual enters their fifth decade, their hippocampal formation uh, begins to shrink. Uh, the supratemporal gyrus also loses its volume. In fact, most areas of the brain begin to lose volume. Oh, I was going to tell you about autopsies. I used to do autopsies, and, and we had this one pathologist. Oh, God, he just drives me crazy. Because, you know, you, you get one of the young pathologists, you go in there, 45 minutes later, you're finished. You know, you chop the guy up, you've done everything that needs to be done, you figured out what was going on. And now you're finished. This other guy, you'd be in there half a day. You'd be in there for four, five, six hours. And he always cut out the brain. Every time he cut out the brain. Now, cutting out the brain's not that hard. What you do is you take a circular saw. Well, you have to kind of scalp them first. And then you take a cir circular saw and you cut out the skull cap. And then you just pull the brain out. It's not that hard. It just takes a while. It takes about 45 minutes to saw through the skull. Uh, but he used to take out the brain every time because he wanted to see the brain, the brain volume. Uh, if it was a really old person, sometimes you'd cut in there and it'd be like half of the brain. You know, the brain had shrunk up so much, it looked like about half of the size of a normal brain. Uh, and sometimes you'd cut into an old guy's head and, and it would be, uh, it'd be right up against the skull. And sometimes you'd, sometimes you'd nick it with a saw, which you weren't supposed to do. Then he'd yell at you. Yeah. Then you just yank it out. Oh, it actually shrinks. It does shrink. Uh, we had this general one time that came in. <laughs> and I had to sign a waiver that said I wouldn't say anything about what, what I saw in this general. He had all kinds of problems. But his brain was, it, it was about this big. I mean, it was literally about that big. And his, his skull was this big. But he had well, died of Alzheimer's. Well, it's this big, right? Well, yeah, normally they fill up the whole skull. You know, they, they're pressing up against the, the, the edge who's, of the... Who was wrong with him for Oh, he had Alzheimer's disease. And of course, the guy didn't tell us, and I'm thinking, damn, this guy's a general and his brain is so tiny. He must be the dumbest guy in the world. And he, of course he was, he died of Alzheimer's disease. Anyway, <laughs> as weird as that sounds. Uh, okay, so what's happening here? Uh, over 4 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease, and of course the general had Alzheimer's disease, and that's why his brain was so tiny. Uh, oddly, the possibility of developing symptoms of Alzheimer's uh, increases 
with age until the age of 85, and then it starts to decline for those people who have never developed the symptoms. In other words, if you can make it to age 85, you don't have to worry about Alzheimer's disease anymore. You, cannot, you will not develop Alzheimer's disease after age 85. So if you made it this far, you're good to go for the rest of your life. Okay. And that's why if, you, if you've ever been around people uh, that are in their 80s and 90s, uh, if they're lucid, they'll stay lucid. My mother was lucid until about the last six months of her life. She died at 98. And she was still fairly functional. She was still even physically uh, functional into her, into her middle 90s. Yeah. Uh, we went to, where did we go? We went to Chillicothe, Ohio. They have Indian mounds there. And uh, they have the snake mound and the bird mound are, are over there. Uh, and she walked up the, up the hill at 95, you know. Of course, I'm in my but there's, uh, 60s. Like, like what we talk about people with like brain injuries, there's stuff to combat this, right? Because the people who have brain injuries have more of a chance to develop in this. Uh, potentially. It all, the, the biggest problem with people with TBI is that um, it's... It's more of a struggle for them to keep their intellectual intellectual functioning uh, functioning at a high rate. It's harder for them to study. It's harder for them to do this. It's harder for them to do that. And for that reason, a lot of times they just stop. They just slow down and stop. Once you stop, it's all over with. Not just for somebody with TBI, but for anybody. You need to continue to stimulate your brain. And if you continue to stimulate your brain, the probability of developing Alzheimer's disease is much, much less. People develop Alzheimer's disease is a, is a um, uh, lack of use disease. It's like getting fat when you don't run or, or lift weights or, or whatever. You've got to continue to exercise your brain your entire life. And if you don't exercise your brain, you go brain dead. Yeah, well, yeah, in essence you do. Uh, and that can include watching television. Watching television is, is a neutral act. It's not, it's not intellectually stimulating, uh, depending on what you watch. I, well, there you, that's, that, that's different every day. So that's a good thing. I mean, that works, but... Uh, football. But my dad used to watch the same... He used to watch McClintock on television. And I knew as soon as I had seen this McClintock three or four times, that he wasn't getting any stimulation. And uh, he started suffering, not really from Alzheimer's disease, but uh, his intellectual functioning just, just plummeted because he was getting no stimulation whatsoever. So we would go over uh, to, to uh, you know, my parents' house and we would, we would talk to him, you know, try to get him to, to talk about politics. And this, he loved politics, loved to, to talk about politics. He was a Republican. I know. He hated Reagan. <laughs> he was also a banker, and he knew all the banking laws by heart. And uh, Reagan changed some of the banking laws and screwed everything up. You guys are both too young to remember, but Ronald Reagan, they had a uh, savings and loan uh, fiasco that happened right after uh, Reagan's administration. It was, happened during the uh, Bush administration, but it was because they changed the laws. They changed the banking laws. And they allowed them to the banks to make more money, and they were doing this by by investing their money in, in shady uh, shady things, and the savings and loans were the first ones to go out. But then they didn't change the laws, and then we had that uh, that economic downturn in 2008 because they didn't change the laws back to what they were before. Anyway, so my dad hated. That. <laughs> yeah. We used to get him to talk. We could get him to talk about that any time. <laughs> oh, my poor dad. Alzheimer's disease starts as a memory loss but progresses into greater and greater cognitive function decline until the individual can no longer carry on a conversation. Alzheimer's is accompanied by a marked uh, cortical atrophy, especially in the frontal, temporal, and parietal, parietal areas. Uh, this has to do with hearing, this has to do with thinking, this has to do with movement. Uh, so if you've ever been around somebody with Alzheimer's disease, pretty soon they can't, they can't walk anymore. Yeah. Uh, all they can do is sit up, and that's about it. Uh, eventually, of course, they can't do that anymore, and then they die. 
Uh, the brains of Alzheimer's patients show degeneration of axon terminals and dendrites caused by the buildup of beta amyloid uh, forming senile plaque. Amyloid precursor protein is bound by two enzymes, beta secretase and presenilin. Uh, if uh, one of these uh, enzymes mutates, amyloid plaque builds up. And of course, this is the stuff that cleans out your brain. It takes this stuff out. And if it doesn't take it out, then all of a sudden it accumulates and now we got a problem. So we need to continue to get rid of it. Why don't we stop right here? I'll, t I'll talk about APOE2 and APOE3. Individuals with, uh, with one of these, um, APOE4 is less efficient than APOE3, 2, and 3. So if you've got this guy, then uh, your SOL, well, not really, uh, because you can continue to stimulate yourself, stimulate your brain. Playing with yourself. Thinking, thinking. <laughs> Persephus.